we can all agree that Jesus, at this point in the gospel, Jesus is a very, very interesting, very different uh, religious leader from any other religion uh, that we can we can name, right? I mean, who as a religious leader coming to establish a kingdom, who as a religious leader coming to preach the good news of the gospel is welcoming in children. Buddha didn't do that. When you think of Buddha, you don't identify Buddha uh, as, as some child-loving person. When, when you think of Muhammad, you don't think of someone who, who loved children and welcomed children in. But anytime we can think about who is Jesus, we cannot disassociate him from children and how children were attracted to Jesus and, and mainly how Jesus was always bringing children to the forefront. And that has huge implications that we'll get into uh, in just a moment. These verses that were just read are probably the most significant uh, verses and the most referenced verses when, when anyone wants to talk about Jesus and children, and then I would suggest that they're also the most misapplied verses to when we think about in terms and in view of Jesus and children, both when we look through Scripture, when we're reading through Scripture, it's always, always imperative for us to look beyond the Scripture and see how Scripture is interpreting itself. So in the Gospels, you have several accounts of the life of Jesus, and many of them are very similar in the stories that they, that they give. They're not contradicting each other, but they're just giving their account of it. And so we find this similar story. If we want to see what's happening in this story, well, let's look at Matthew's account and see how close it is to that. And then let's look at Luke's account. Now, if you were to just kind of thumb over uh, to Luke's account, you're going to see something very interesting. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 10, we, we find something pretty significant happening. It's the story of the tax collector and the religious person doing a prayer service. Y'all remember this story? Very fascinating story. This is right pinned right before this story happens. But only Luke account gives us the story of the prayer of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Y'all remember how the prayer went? <laughs> Pharisee's up there praying. He's like, man, I am so good. All right, this is Matthew's paraphrase. Look how awesome I am. I tithe. I serve in kids. I wipe their butts. I do everything. I am awesome. Look how awesome I am, God. And then you have like this other account, this, this tax collector. And he goes into the temple and he's praying and he's beating his chest. And he says, how, how can God love me? Like I am unclean. I am filthy. And Jesus gives us this illustration. And he says, which one of these guys are the, are the ones who are justified? It's certainly not the dude who thinks he's got it all together. He says, only one of them is going to walk away justified, and it's the one who is coming to me on his knees. Now, that's, that's significant, especially since the story that was just read. Now, I believe this, that could have, in fact, if I were to look at this and try to um, harmonize these stories, you can see at the very end of Mark chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus just got through and he's talking to them. He's about to tell them an answer about divorce that we talked about last week. Now he's outside of the house. And then he goes back into the house. Now, this story of the Pharisee and the tax collector that Luke gives us in this account, it likely happens in between those two verses. And it's the story of who gets to go to heaven. That's the, I think that's the thing that's being presented to us. Who's the person that makes it? Who's the person that's justified? Who's the person that gets to enter into the kingdom of God? That's the question that's being posed in this passage. 
And with that on the back end, with this Pharisee thinking that because he's done all these great things, because he looks the part, because he plays the part, because he does all the things that he checks off all the lists that he gets to enter in. And Jesus said he does not get to enter in. The one who's on his knees gets to enter in. And then Jesus takes them into the story where there's children. Isn't it interesting? It just seems like children. Anytime Jesus needs a sermon illustration, he's always got it. Like he's a, if, there, if he's going to use a child for a sermon illustration, it just seems like one of them little whippersnappers are always around. He just grabs one and just takes them. All right, all right boys, we're going we're to use you again. And in this story, Jesus does that very thing. Jesus is seizing on the opportunity that, she, that children provide to make perfectly clear what's happening in this passage and what is the story of the gospel and who the gospel is for. And it, and it is for this, that here's what Jesus is saying, that the kingdom is for children. He talks about this Pharisee, this, this uh, tax collector in their prayer. It's about a position of your heart more than what it is on what you can do based off of merits and good deeds and actions you can do. I've got some, some headers to help me kind of go through this contextually in here. And I want you to see first and foremost the action of the people. In verse, thir- in verse 13, we're told the action of the people. So people were bringing their little children in. Now, now, now when, I, when, when I was young, it would be the, the picture of, of the mom. The mom would bring the kid in. But... W- Likely in a society, in a Greco-Roman Jewish society, that probably was not the case. It would more look like the father or maybe the oldest son bringing children in before Jesus. I mean, no offense to the ladies, but this is just the type of world that they were living in. And so it's likely that, so, so dad would probably bring them, and, and surely they've heard of this Jesus of Nazareth, Right? And I, and I, and I, and I, man, I'm so glad that, that there were parents there that, that had the um, discernment and ability to, to think that, hey, this, this guy may be, may, maybe he is who he's saying he is. If there's anybody that I want him to bless, I, I want him to bless my children. Right? I, want, I want him to touch my kid. I want him to hold my kid. I want him to welcome in my child. And so the reaction of the parents and the reaction of the people, it, 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 is, it, is, it is what our reaction should be. I, unfortunately, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that I, even as myself, that this would be my reaction. Now, I would hope that in the presence of God in flesh, that I would have that discernment to bring Jude, Nora, and Ezra, because Holy Spirit, God knows they need, like, touch them. As a matter of fact, lay them out on the ground. You know, just bathe them and wash them clean. I would be that parent right there in the front row. And I would hope that that would be all of our response. But unfortunately, I don't think that's, that's who I am in this story. Because you have this parental response and the people response, but then you have the response of the disciples and the reaction of the disciples. If I were to just summarize it in one word, it would be distasteful. That, that the disciples would react in such a way that I think that they've gotten too big for their britches. That's like an old saying. I sound like I'm 95 years old right now. They're, they think that they are, you know, some uppity person that, you know, I, I, I'm thinking way more highly of myself. Jesus, you just got through talking about divorce. You, you don't need these children bothering you. Isn't that, a, it's so funny how the disciples, they just, they, they, they always seem to have this disconnect where, where, where Jesus' presence is welcoming in people, but who are the people who have become a barrier uh, for the presence of God? Who? The disciples. They become, a, they become a barrier for people to get into the presence of the living God. They seem to be good at it, too, at this point. And you remember back in 
Gosh, it seemed like it was ages ago when we were in chapter 9. Uh, when we were in chapter 9, you know, they're, they're coming off the mountain of transfiguration, and they just saw the glory of Jesus just kind of r- ripping through the skin of Jesus. And, and, and suddenly there's like this little uh, rift between the disciples and this little argument. And you know what they're arguing? Well, who's going to be the greatest? Who's, who's the best Jesus? You know, rightful thinking in their mind. They're probably thinking, well, Jesus keeps on talking about dying and, and leaving us. Then, then we need an heir of this Messiahship. And what does Jesus do? Jesus does what Jesus do. He gets a child. And he uses a child as this illustration of the kingdom of God. If you want to enter into the kingdom of God, if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, here's a child. Act like them. Now, now that's the reaction of the disciples. Again, I, I, I say, you know, gosh, I never get it. You know, they're just a bunch of dummies. I, I, I've, got to, I've got to be honest with you. I'd be the same way. You've got to understand what a Greco-Roman view of a child was. They're, they were the same uh, view as that of a slave. They were insignificant. They were lowly, like nobody cares about the children. And so you got to think these disciples are like, well, why, why, why are we going to waste our time with the living God, like with Jesus, with the Messiah, with these insignificant people? And so you, you see how the people responded. You see the reaction of the disciples. And I want you to pay attention to the reaction of Jesus because Jesus begins to get really just this indignation and it's justifiable in verse 14 Jesus saw this he was in, indignant and and these characters you know maybe they're just getting too big for for whatever reason uh, you know and it just seems like just sometimes how can you how can you be like with God for so long and then like immediately like you're drawn back into a sinful pattern of life well, you just look at the disciples and you see how easy it is. It seemed like a common occurrence for disciples would be send the people away. And then the response of Jesus would be like, keep the people near. You think back when Jesus fed the multitude of people, right? What did the disciples do? What was their immediate response? Well, everybody's getting hangry. We got to send these folks away. Jesus says, don't, don't send these folks away. Well, the people are hungry. Well, well, you feed them. Well, we ain't got no food. Well, give me the fish and the loaf. Father blessed his fish and the loaf. The fish and the loaf feed like thousands of people. And Jesus leaves them with 12 barrels of, it's almost like Jesus got a little sarcasm in him. He's just kind of like, like just sticking it to the disciples a little bit and saying, now how much we got left? One for each one of y'all. Y'all just so worried about pushing people out. But the way of Jesus is to bring people in. It's, it's, it's just, it's an interesting thing because the, the disciples uh, at times are a barrier rather than a bridge between people in Christ. You know that the church can also be a barrier. Do I need to say that one more time as we used to say in the South? The church can also become a barrier for people in Christ. You can be a barrier for someone to meet Christ. It's, it's a terrifying thought. Very strange thought too. But what are some of the barriers that we put in our life that cause us to want to say, you know what? Not for you. I'm not going to share the gospel. These are barriers. So we have the action of the people, reaction of disciples, the The righteous anger of Jesus towards um, the disciples. And then then we see how how Jesus gives 
uh, more into this reaction or this or this indignation, this righteous anger and how he instructs them. In verse 14, he said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. The kingdom of God belongs to these. It's, it's in Greek. It's, it's, what, it's a musical term that we use, staccato. It's when your mom's really angry and she talks to you like this. Some of y'all got to dial back many years to remember when mom used to talk. And maybe you remember talking to your child like this. Don't you ever talk to me like this again. Now I knew when Frida would talk to me like that, things were bad. The belt was about to come out and I was about to run because I did not want that belt meeting my behind. Now, you also got to know that I was the grid child. All right, the other two, my other two, and that's a true story. The other two, they were the ones, of course, I was the youngest, so I learned. All right, here's how not to act as a child. And I remember when my mom, she'd get that staccato voice and talk like that, like, like Hurricane Freed about to blow through. And this is what Jesus is using. He's using that same staccato-like language. Let the kids come. Do not hinder them. The kingdom belongs to them. Do not hinder them. The kingdom of God belongs to the children. It ties in the words of Matthew 11, and I'll get back to Matthew 11, but before he issues an incredible invitation, he says, Jesus, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Jesus understands what he's doing here. He's understanding and wanting us to see the nature of children, the place of children, and the value of children when it comes to the matter of understanding the gospel and how we enter into the kingdom. And he says, here it is. Be like a child. Now, notice it's childlike. And please don't twist it with childish. Now, some of the parents are nodding because you know exactly what I'm talking about, how your child become the most petty betty on the planet. They argue, they bicker, they lie, they complain and complain and complain. They're worse than the children of Israel lost in the wilderness. And you just want to tell them God's going to abandon you and leave you in the desert. (laughs) Because that is the childish behavior and Jesus is not suggesting nor would he ever imply that in order to get to the kingdom you've got to be childish in your behavior because we know childish behavior is spoken out against in the Bible as sins so Jesus is not saying to us that you got to act like just a ridiculous temper tantrum, lying little child who's going to complain his whole life and demand his parents to do something for them, all right? All right maybe this is therapy. I don't know. It just feels like, like, like your children are like, can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? Can you get this? Can I have this? Can I do this? And I just want to say, can you just shut up? I am not the slave. You, like, this is, this is not how this is to work. Jesus does not suggest that we are to act in the childish manner. He is not saying that. He is saying you are to enter into the kingdom. And the only ones who get to enter into the kingdom are those who are childlike. What is Jesus doing and saying here? I don't believe that Jesus is saying, again, that it's about the arguing. But I think it's more about the objectives of the characteristics of the children. Again, when you view this in the context of that it's written, in a Greco wicked Roman empire where children were helpless, where children could not bring anything to the table, where children were viewed less than a slave, Jesus is saying, so the position of your heart is how you're going to enter into the kingdom. And the position of your heart has to be like one of these kids the helpless, the insignificant the ones who can't do anything for themselves, the ones who can't do any, can't bring nothing to the table. They cannot contribute to society. They can't contribute to culture. 
If you want the kingdom of God, and if you want to receive the kingdom of God, you have to acknowledge your helplessness in the situation. <laughs> and and, and that's, that's hard in our culture that we live in. Because we are a culture of achievement. We are a culture of... What, what, how good can I be? How can I be better than the other person around me? How can I be better than my coworker? How can I be better than my spouse? How can I be a better parent than my neighbor is? How can I do this? And so we think through the lens of achievement and greatness. And Jesus says, if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, then you've got to lay aside your achievements and you've got to come in with a position that says, I am helpless and I can't do anything. I, I, I have nothing to offer. I am a sinner. I have nothing to bring to the table. And Jesus says, if you come to me like that, then yours is the kingdom. You are the one who will be justified. And it goes back to that prayer that this, these two guys are praying. It's the, one, it's the one who's saying, look how good I am. Look how I tithe. Look how I memorize all of this. I attend church. I do this. You know, I check off all the lists. And then the other guy, I, I'm a sinner. I'm a tax collector. I don't see how people can look at me at any other way. And the one who is justified is the one who has the position of the child. And this is why Jesus brings in this child and says, listen, if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, then here's what you got to do. It's just real simple. You don't do nothing. You come in with the mentality that you don't have anything to bring. You come in with the mentality that you have nothing to offer. For, for, for yours will be the kingdom there's just a couple of application things that I think are uh, really just kind of screaming out at me as I, as I kind of read through this um, this week, as I read through this last night. Uh, that, uh, yeah, it's just been a week. As, as I read through this, as I, and I was just thinking about what is happening in here, and I think it has a lot to do with our gospel approach. We, we, in other words, in how we present the gospel and how we respond to the gospel. So I'll, I'll try to tackle this first one and how we present the gospel. There is kind of this unspoken pressure that we have in the, the world of church, right, in the world of Christianity that says that you have to present the gospel in such a theologically correct and sophisticated way in order for someone to hear it. Now, we may... You know, you're not going to say that out loud. But if I were, if I were, I, I just, I, I'm not a betting man. Maybe I used to be, but I'm not anymore. Um, I did win a lot of money one time in Biloxi, but that's, not a, that's neither here nor there. Um, you, you've got to, you've, you've got to understand this. If I were to ask you the question, do you present the gospel? And how many times a day are you sharing the gospel? I, I've, I've got this sense in my heart. Maybe I'm wrong. That the reason why we will not present the gospel is because we just feel like we're inadequate and we cannot, in a sophisticated way, articulate it that, that reaches such a dynamic, theological, you know, thunderous way that they will be captivated. And look how much I know. If the person walks away and they say to you, wow. You really know your theology, and they did not have a connection from their heart. What did you win? I know this from personal experience. I was, I was witnessing years ago to some Jehovah's Witnesses, and, and they were in their, later in their age, and they had been a part of the Jehovah's Witnesses, I mean, longer than I had been alive. And after I talked to them, the lady looked at me and she, she had a smile on her face and she said, you really seem to know your theology. And it broke my heart because that wasn't the point. The point wasn't to, in some sophisticated way, share the gospel so that they could look at me and say, wow, you're, you're a really learning guy there. There, there was the holy, like it just was not this connection to their heart. And I know, I understand that's not my job. But in the end, like, what does it matter if you said it in a sophisticated way? 
it, it's indicative of how we, we believe we are supposed to be sharing the gospel and it's just for sophisticated people to share and it's just for, you know, and we think of in terms of who are the type of people uh, that, that, you know, and maybe it's not you, but I, I, I'm a, I observe culture and I observe especially the church culture and I, I see how people flock to a certain type of um, communicator or a certain type of uh, preacher and I, and I see a lot of similarities in, 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 in what they are drawn to. He's really smart and he, he looks really good, dresses super dapper communicates in such a way that just, you know, man, I wish I can, I, I can just put my words together like so-and-so. Oh, and by the way, he's a Christian. <laughs> because really what matters are um, the, charis- the charisma of the person. And so it seems like we seem to be more drawn to people who look like they have it together, who dress a certain way, who articulate in a certain matter, Oh, and by the way, who are also Christian. Jesus lays out on the, the table and Jesus takes a child and he sets them in the middle of the room. and He says, unless you become as little and as helpless as this kid, you ain't going to no kingdom. You, ain't, you, ain't, you won't be justified. Unless you come to me like, like one of these kids. Maybe, maybe if, if anything for us, and, and what I can, to sum up this w- one little point here, take the pressure off. No one put it on you. The Bible certainly didn't put it on you. That you have to be a seminary grad, someone who is theologically rooted in order just to announce the kingdom of God. You don't, you don't have, like, take that pressure off of you. It's, it reminds me of Paul when he's talking to the church of Corinth. And Paul says, God chose to the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. That, he was talking about Matthew Thrower. He, he chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify that are. So Paul's writing to the Corinthians and he says... There aren't too many noble people in your church right now. There aren't too many people who are upper class. There aren't too many people who are the power brokers and who are, you know, who are these uppity people. You know why there aren't? Because they don't get this kingdom stuff. They don't get and they don't understand that the kingdom is for children. You will not get the kingdom of God if you do not understand that the kingdom is for children. And by that I mean that if your heart is not postured as the little one, if, you're not, if your heart is not in the posture of as the helpless one, then the kingdom is not for you. The kingdom is only for those who are on their knees like the tax collector saying, woe is me. Woe is me, for I am unclean. Or like the child who is viewed less than a slave, woe is me, for I have nothing to bring. I have nothing to offer society. The kingdom is for the children. I think this also teaches us in how to respond to the gospel, to enter into its benefits. And we've got this kingdom that lasts forever. And when we look at our lives and we see how the accomplishments weigh before God of the universe, we'll see in, a, in an instant that it mattered. Like it just didn't have no significance and no value at all. Those things that we were chasing after. The, the big job, the big house, all of those things that we're trying to achieve in life. When we step foot in the presence of the living God, we'll know in the instant none of those things even mattered. I'm reminded back into to Nicodemus. I think if, if, if John had a supportive 
story in this, in, the, in, in his account, it would be John chapter 3. If you remember when Nicodemus, the religious leader, comes before Jesus, he's at night. You know, so Nicodemus is right there at Jesus' night. He's just kind of a little scared. Don't want other people to see that he's talking to the supposed Messiah. And, and he goes, again, with the same posture of, I'm religious, I do good, I, I've done all these incredible things, and, and surely if I'm a Pharisee or whatever you are, you, you've memorized the Torah, you've memorized all these scriptures, and, and Jesus, what say you? How, I'm, I'm in, right? And you remember Jesus' response in John chapter 3, the most famous, most quoted? You must be what? Born again. Nicodemus gives the right response. How on earth can I be born again? Because it is biologically impossible. It, you, what, is, what, is, what is Nicodemus saying? You mean to tell me I've got to become like a child again? And Jesus is like, you better believe it. If you want this new way of life, if you want the kingdom of God, then yeah, you've got to be born again. You've got to come back to me like a little baby and like a little child. Isn't it, isn't it just kind of staggering for us? And, and I, would, I would kind of just, I would bet that for some of you, you've got such a relief on you right now because now suddenly what you've been working after all those achievements all the greatness of life suddenly you're telling me that that doesn't matter yeah I'm telling you it doesn't matter when it comes to the kingdom of God what Christ is looking for is for people to come to him who are little and who are helpless this I want to tell you today that when I read this it was a reminder for me that Christ, our Messiah, Jesus is still in the business of gathering a people up into his arms and a people who will say to him, I'm little, I'm insignificant, I'm helpless. And the response, the only response that Jesus will give you are his arms wide open. It's why I go back to Matthew chapter 11 with the most incredible, profound invitations ever written and ever given by anyone. Come to me, all who are weary, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, first what you got to do, you got to come to him and realize that you're weary, you're heavy laden, you're helpless, and you're little. And then the rest comes, and then he picks you up in his arms, and he carries you the rest of the way. Jesus takes this little child and brings him to the center of attention in the center of the room. And these disciples are baffled at how could a child be the illustration of who gets in, and Jesus says, you want the kingdom of, of God, then you need to become little and helpless, weary, heavy laden, burdened, broken. The kingdom is yours. Let's pray.